started. So today we're going to talk about light as a wave. So previously we've been talking about light acting like a ray. Uh, and another way that you might think about that is uh, light acting like a particle. And so when light is acting like a particle, we call that a photon. So for example, when you have a mirror, then you could imagine light bouncing off of your foot coming off of the mirror and then going to your eyeball. So you could imagine that as just a photon doing that. And then that kind of makes sense, right? So if you imagine a photon as like a little ball, then the photon bouncing off of the mirror and uh, the angle that it bounces at seems intuitive for what you might expect for like a tennis ball or something. So all the, all the stuff that we've done so far with mirrors and lenses, uh, that was light acting like a particle or a photon. Now we're going to talk about light, light acting like a wave. And so the two of these things together are called the wave particle duality. And so that's just when something exhibits properties of both a wave and a particle. And so how we're going to treat light uh, really just depends on the situation that light is in and what it's interacting with. Uh, so to give you an example that has nothing to do with physics, so uh, so if I wrote this word down. Would you guys say that this is, or what part of speech would you guys say this is? Okay, so some people say noun, but I object, right? So it could also be a verb. So it really just depends on the context that I'm using this thing in. So it's kind of the same thing with light. So, or as we'll see maybe later in the class, any kind of particle. Uh, depending on what that particle is doing or what it's interacting with, uh, it might be better to treat it as a particle or it might be better to treat it as a wave. Uh, and you might, see this wave particle duality as 
some people describe it as a weird thing. And it's really just that we, for whatever reason, we have decided that something can't be both a wave and a particle. Uh, so when we first discovered that light acted in both ways, scientists thought it was really weird. Uh, but it's, you shouldn't think of it as weird. You should just think of it as uh, like, it is both and you won't know what, how to treat it until you are given a specific situation. So we've already seen light acting like a particle when it was bouncing off of mirrors or going through different lenses. And so now we'll focus on wave behavior. And so we might have seen some of these equations before. So the speed of light is equal to the frequency of light times its wavelength. So we've seen a little bit of wave behavior because we've said that light has different wavelengths and we experience those different wavelengths as colors. And so this is one of the equations that uh, we will need. And then we have seen that the index of refraction so when light is entering some medium that's equal to the speed of light divided by the speed of light in that medium or material So we can relate the speed of an object in a material to the wavelength of light in that material with the following equation. So this is the initial wavelength. This is the index of refraction. And then this is the wavelength in the material. And so because we know that the index of refraction has to be at least one if it was in vacuum and then greater than one for any other kind of material, then the wavelength inside of the material is going to be less than the initial wavelength. So let's move on to some conceptual things that deal with the wave behavior of light. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about first is Huygens principle. And so this doesn't 
uh, necessarily deal with only light, but just all waves in general. And so there's uh, some words associated with it, and then I'll show you what it looks like in a picture form. So every point on a wave front is a source of wavelets that spread out in the direction of propagation of the wave. So the direction of propagation is just the direction that the wave is traveling. At the same speed as the wave itself. The new wave front is a line tangent to all wavelets. So there might be some words that you don't know yet, but I'll draw a picture on the next slide that will explain this. And then the picture will look like this. So let's say this is our wave source. And so you've got a wave coming out like that. And so this line, which should be tangent to the curve is our wave front. And so I'll just draw some random spots along the wave front. And those will be the sources for our wavelets. And the wavelets are the like the these different dots that I've drawn could be closer together or farther together. I've just kind of drawn them this way for, uh, so you can see enough of them, but you're not gonna be overwhelmed with lines. And so the, the new wave front is perpendicular to these wavelets. And then you could do the same thing again. Have your new point to draw where the wavelets are originating from. And just continue this for however long this wave is gonna continue to propagate.
And so now this is the picture for when the wave is just propagating freely. There's nothing in its way. There's nothing that it's interacting with. And so in this picture, you might think in your head that this would be equivalent to just a photon traveling this way. This is for a freely propagating. Okay. So now we're going to take that same wave source, or maybe I'll call it a light source for now. And over here, I'm going to put a screen that has two slits in it. So the openings are called slits. And these slits will be separated by some distance. I'll, I'll draw the distance later. And then over here, we're going to have some something that interacts with light. So you could imagine this as like photography, film, or something that measures the brightness of light. And now we're going to shine a light through this pair of slits. And we're going to see what happens on the other side. So you could imagine this is like a flashlight or something. So if light only acted like a photon, then you would expect it to travel and you had the different photons coming out like that then you would expect the ones that were to hit the center of the slit to not go through. And then all of the other ones you would expect to just travel in a straight line to the other side. And so on your photographic film, you would have a couple of bright spots with the center being open because that's where the center of the slit So when you do this experiment, and this is called a double, double slit 
experiment. This is not at all what you see. So instead, what we're going to see is that when light interacts with something like this, it acts like a wave. So if this is your wave source, Now, as it enters each of these slits, now this, the plane that the slit is in, this is our new wave front. And so if we just take the center of each slit to be the points that we were drawing, what you're going to see is that now we basically have two different waves that are interacting with each other. So before we just had one wave that was propagating one propagating. Wave. And now here, we can think about this as two propagating waves. So maybe on the next slide, I'll do kind of a simple demonstration, but uh, are you guys familiar with some interesting things that can happen when two waves are interacting? Do they interact with each other at all or do they just ignore each other? Okay, so there are going to be two types of that interaction. So we'll, that's what I'll show you. Okay, so the two types of interactions that the wave, the two waves can have with each other So. I'll draw the waves in different colors. And so let's just put some numbers on this to have a number. So if you look at the red wave and the blue wave, if I add up the all of the numbers that would make up the red wave, like here, oh, this should I did this one. Positive 10 and negative 10. When the red wave is at positive 10, the blue wave is at negative 10. When the red wave is at zero, the blue wave is at zero. 
when the blue wave is at positive 10, the red wave is at negative 10, and so on. So at all of these points, the two waves are going to destructively interfere. So wave interactions are called interference. And so when they cancel out, that's called destructive. interference, or in other words, the waves cancel. Then if we look at this other one, let's say this one is at one, the negative one. Then when you add these two waves together, you'll get something that has the same wavelength, but now it has a greater amplitude. And so this is constructive. interference. And so you'll notice that with these waves, they are like they have the same frequency and they're like for the constructive interference, they're in the same phase. Um, so things can get more complicated if, if things have different frequency or they're sh shifted left or right a little bit, uh, but that's beyond uh, the scope of this class and what we're talking about in this example. So because waves interact in this way, you can have constructive or destructive interference. And because light sometimes acts like a wave, light will also have constructive and destructive interference. And that's exactly what people saw when they did this double slit experiment. So instead of just seeing two bright patches on the the screen on the far side. Instead, what they saw was a more interesting pattern. Let me see if I draw a graph. So the first thing that they saw that was different was that the center of this part where the directly behind uh, where the center of the slit is, this was a the brightest point. And then there was a dip and then another bright point that wasn't quite as bright as the center point and so on until there wasn't really any light uh, off to the sides. And so that was symmetric across both sides. And I'll try to draw that symmetrically. And so this thing that I've drawn would be a, this would be a graph of the brightness with 
with respect to position. So on the film, what you might actually see would be this area is very blue. And then there wouldn't be really much of anything. And then this area is pretty blue. And then a little less blue and a little less blue as you go out. If this was a, say for example, a blue light. So we'll return to this experiment when we talk about quantum mechanics uh, and we'll see a very interesting effect. Uh, so maybe as a teaser, so if you imagine this light source is just constantly spitting out photons. And so there's always light that's hitting the slit and then interfering and making this pattern. If you instead send one photon at a time, what you're going to see is that over time, this picture will slowly be built up one photon at a time. Uh, and so that gets into the probable, probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. And like I said, we'll talk about that maybe next week. So uh, there's an equation that will govern where these bright spots will occur. And so if you make a, a horizontal line coming from the center of your slit to the center of the screen, and you measure angles, with respect to that horizontal line, then uh, the equation that I'll write on the next slide will tell you where those bright spots will appear. So for the double slit, or the constructive interference, we have this equation, d sine theta equals n, and I forgot to, so the distance d is the distance from the opening of each slit. So if you take the top of the top slit and measure the bottom of the bottom slit, that's the distance D in this equation. So D, I'll, I'll label what these mean in a second. M takes on these values. So basically any integer from negative infinity to positive infinity, including zero. So if you want to know the angle of the central point, then you would pick zero for N. Then you would see that sine, if you wanna know what angle you need to put into sine to get zero degrees, sine of zero is zero. So that's where the first slit is. But then if you want the say where the first slit is going to be, or the, not the first slit, the, the first, the first peak in your graph, that's one 
away from the central peak. Then you pick one for M. And then depending on the wavelength of the light and the distance of separation for the slit, you can solve for the angle like this. So D is the slit distance or width maybe would be a better this is the angular position of the peaks. M is this integer placeholder and then lambda is the wavelength. Then for the destructive, or where there's not going to be a peak, uh, you have a similar equation, uh, but it's offset by a half, like this. And so all of those variables are the same. Then there's one more type of experiment that we'll talk about today. And this is for a single slit. So same setup as before, your light source. And then now instead of a double slit, we're going to have a single slit. And so again, if light was just a photon, you would expect one bright spot in the center and then nothing else. Um, and in this case, that's kind of what you see, uh, but there's going to be some extra stuff going on. So again, we'll take the waves coming from our light source And at the split, we'll have our new wavefront. And remember, I could draw these new points on the wavefront to make wavelets anywhere I wanted to. So even though there's only one slit, I can draw two new sources of wavelets. And now because some of the 
uh, incoming wave is not going to make it through to the other side of the slit in the same way that it entered the slit. We're going to, again, have some constructive and destructive interference uh, with the light as it enters the slit. And so this pattern is, again, going to have a bright central peak. But then all of the other peaks are the same size. So they don't, they start, they're very small and they don't uh, get smaller as you go further out. And so just like with the double slit, uh, we have an equation for the single slit. And so for this one, we're gonna look at the destructive locations. And so for destructive interference, it's going to be D sine theta equals M lambda. So this is, kind of the opposite of what it was for the double slit. And so the distance D is now the slit width of the single slit. And now M is similar to the single slit, but it doesn't include zero. So um, M it goes from negative infinity, negative two, negative one. And then this time it's not going to include zero, one, two, up to infinity. So any integer except for zero. And so these are just a couple of examples of experiments that people did. And they realized that you can't describe light as just a particle and you need to include a wave description of light in order to capture all of the different things that light can do, especially when it's interacting with other things like, for example, these double or single slits.